Jim signed up for a link today. I don't know if we'll see him today or not. Or live. Oh, we're live streaming. That's is that new, George? It's kind of uh, old. For some reason, no. at, at school I can't do it. When I'm here, I can do it. We'll see him today or not. Or live. Oh, we're live streaming. That's oh, with a delay. Funny. Okay. It's kind of uh, old. For some reason, no. at, at school I can't do it. When I'm here. Okay. Now I got it fixed. Is it delay so that if Mike swears, you can beep it before it happens? Exactly. Be on your best behavior. We're live streaming. Can't take it back. What's a wart racker? Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so if one thing's true, nobody ever swears on the internet. Anyway, no, nope. you want to be the first one. <laughs> Mike, just it's good to see you. Just to give you a heads up, I'm gonna have to leave right after the talk. Great. No, it's okay. The send me an email if you have any thoughts about that. Okay, and I'll go get a charger in one minute. Okay. You can <laughs> start. I'll give you about one more minute, and we'll get get going. Slides. All right, Mike, you good? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody. We're happy to have uh, Michael E. Waugh here today talking about the consumption and welfare effects of a tariff shock. House rules are, if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, uh, and ask your question like you would in a regular seminar. We'll also have time at the end of the, uh, at this, at the seminar to have more discussion and, uh, and questions. Uh, okay, Mike, go ahead, you have an hour. Okay, so, uh, you know, the. Kim and George have been bothering me for a long time to, to participate. And I kept saying no for a lot of reasons, but um, finally, uh, I'm happy to share this. I got a lot of new stuff. If you've seen this before, um, so I'm like, we're at a point where you, like feedback would be uh, very helpful. So here's the deal. About 2016, I got very interested in distributional issues related to trade. And kind of seminal paper when you think about this is Otterdorn and Hansen, in particular, their local labor market effects that they found. So what did they find? Something along the lines of places that were more exposed to Chinese trade had negative labor market consequences, to put it kind of simply. Now, when you want to think about this stuff, when I think about it is, if you want to kind of connect it with welfare, what you want to kind of go is trade, labor market, and then into something that's closer towards welfare, in particular consumption. So I want to see like the exact causal link. And that's the want operator. That was my want operator that started this paper digging around. And fortunately for me, Trump handed me like I think a great like setting to kind of satisfy that want operator. Um, and so that's basically kind of the foundation of those papers is I'm going to provide evidence linking the you know Chinese retaliation. I'll show you some tariff, US tariff stuff as well, but changes in tariffs, how it affects consumption at a narrow geographic level and labor market outcomes. And then what I'm gonna do, the new thing today is what I'm gonna do is I develop a model to kind of interpret this kind of evidence. So this is, this is what took my RAs here, Thomas, he's like, you know, we've been grinding hard on this. Um, so so uh, you know, we'll see what we got. Um, so this is kind of exactly what I said. You know, I want to see tariff-induced changes in consumption at a narrow level. Now, the, one of the problems is when you think start thinking about consumption is how do you actually get data on consumption? 
And you're gonna gotta do like PSID CX, that's not gonna be, sad. it doesn't have broad enough geographic coverage to do this. So you're gonna have to do something else. And I came across this um, data provider where you can buy literally the universe of new auto sales in the United States. So it's not all consumption, but it's a piece of consumption. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna proxy that. That's gonna be my proxy for consumption. And I'm basically gonna correlate it with uh, uh, policy actions during the US-China trade war kind of thing. And one of the things we're gonna see is like super clear evidence. The places that were, in particular for the China side, places that were more exposed to Chinese retaliatory tariffs are going to see, like, I'd say substantial declines in auto sales growth and declines in employment. So this is exactly kind of like fitting in with kind of my want operator here that I wanted to know. The problem is, is when you start looking at this stuff, is it, it, it starts raising, actually, <laughs> you think the data is gonna solve your problems, but it actually raised more questions than, than it answered. So one was about the fact that I have autos and it's a durable good, it's unique and so forth. Um, another issue is that this is a difference in difference kind of framework. So I don't have level effects identified. So it's kind of hard to make welfare statements off of it. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna develop a model this is going to be, um, you know, pretty standard, but in a lot of ways, it took a lot of work to get running. It's going to be Gili Iagari Hug It kind of framework, multi-region, multi-country trade model. And what we're going to do is we're going to simulate, you know, the economy along the transition path in response to both a new shock about tariffs and then the tariffs actually happening. So today, like I can't do everything. <laughs> Thomas can't do everything either. You know, we we kind of only got so far, but I think where we got so far is like some proof of concept that this is working. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. Oh, so one thing I want to say. Like, so like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just uh, very briefly, do you only have the value of sales, or do you have quantities and prices? Is there something going on in prices, or is this really about the consumption? So I not, only especially have durable goods. Yeah, so I only have, I have the opposite. I only have quantities. I don't have prices. So we can talk about it more about, I mean, the like a threat to the identification, if you want a causal claim, would be something along the lines that there were differential price responses for cars across markets within the US. I, I like, I, I'm never gonna be able to answer that question. I mean, I think the first instance is most of these prices are nationally set. Um, you know, there could be financing conditions and stuff like that. That's what's hard to kind of tease out, but I, it's just quantities right now. Right, but it's quantities of different cars. So you can look at luxury versus non-luxury cars and stuff. Okay. A, a, a tiny question. Is there a way to quantify the fact that for developing nations, manufacturing something like an automobile has a uh, prestige element to it and also an ability to influence other countries such as uh, putting up auto plants in Kazakhstan or other places such as um, uh, uh, other countries around China have done? I mean, there could be, but that's not what I'm talking about. Cause I want to okay. like, think about right. car, like think about cars is just this, this is I, like, this is why I want to set the framework again. Cause like, think about this is that I'm in some community like say it's, I hate to say soybeans, but just like it's concrete and it was hit. So I'm in Iowa and then I turn on the news and then Trump basically says, I'm gonna start a trade war with China and I'm in Iowa and my soybean production is totally directed towards China. And I wanna ask, what does that guy do? Does he eat less? And then the way I'm gonna proxy whether he's eating less is if he stops buying a car or not. That's the idea. So the car, yeah. So that's the thing. This, I, this is important to what it says because a lot of people want to think about the traditional kind of view, traditional trade view on this isn't about the labor demand side that I was just talking about. It's more along the side that prices went up, so I eat less. No, no, no. I'm thinking about a community is facing a demand shock for their labor, a negative demand shock for their labor. And I want to see how that feeds into, into, into what they eat. Okay, so here's how I'm going to measure tariff exposure. This is pretty standard. I see. Um... Sorry, <laughs> yeah. Can I ask one question before yeah. you do that? No, no, um, you, so I, you you're the, actually the one who I wanted to say, like, call out. The thing is, is like, this is what relates to your paper, but 
Oh, that, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, but thank you. But I, my question was about the previous slide. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so it was just about you. You you mentioned the durability of auto, right? So when you think about what when you relate the decline in auto purchases to the fall in actual consumption in that county, are you adjusting for potential substitution between durables and non-durables because you can delay spending on durables or? Um, is it, I yeah. mean, the model, the model will have that. So in the, no, no, because I just, I just didn't understand whether the model has durable goods in it or not. It's yeah, the model will have durable goods. Yeah. So this is a big model, Bealey, Igari, Hug it, plus durable, non-durable labor supply kind of thing. So um, lots going on here. Thank you. So that, that, I just missed that. So yeah. thank you. Um, so I'm going to basically do this thing where you find tariffs at the sector level and then apportion it to a county based on their um, employment share in that sector. So that's a, I got this equation right here kind of thing. The weights are going to be in 2017. If you kind of don't understand this. Just think again, the soybean example is like if I'm a county in Iowa and all my employment is in soybean production, then the tariff, Chinese tariff apportioned to that county will be just the soybean tariff. Okay. So there's a different ways you can do it. And there's a question like, and how you actually want to map this into this, but this is kind of a very simple, simple way to do this kind of thing. Um, I'm going to do this both for the Chinese and US side. Most of this stuff is, mo I think the clearest evidence is always on the, on the Chinese side. But then if you guys want to ask questions about the US side, we can talk about it as well. Here's like, if you don't remember- Just one question, yeah. Mike. Uh, it, you know, when, when you are aggregating the tariffs, you put the MFN tariffs together with the trade war tariffs? Or do you consider that their effects separately? I mean, I think China, for example, I think some of the MFN tariffs changed through this period. And in any case, MFN, of course, has, you know, works differently than the, the, the trade war tariffs. Yeah, so I like, I think I'm taking care of this. I don't remember exactly how I did it. So you can kind of see the blue line on this. Like that's the, where, let me see a Chinese tariff on US exports. No, no, that's not the blue light. So yeah, you're right. China started varying this stuff relative to things, but basically the way I'm starting this is I start at the MFN tariff level and then I see the incremental China stuff. Because the China and the US stuff is, is on top of whatever the initial tariff rate was. Does that answer your question? Okay. I see, okay, because I guess an alternative would be to have both, you know, the, the MFN tariff, I guess we can think about that as a control and then the trade war tariff kicking in in 2018. I think that's what I'm doing. That's, a, that's like, what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right okay. here. Because you see, see okay. like this is, I'm going to factor in the pre-period kind of thing. So the, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, so this is like, I mean, COVID happened and you forget everything kind of thing, but this was, this is kind of the, the deal that, that was occurring. So basically around, you know, April 2018, the United States started taking and announcing certain actions that were signaling that they were going to put large scale tariffs on Chinese goods. And then very quickly in response, the Chinese government said, okay, we're going to put tariffs back right on top of you. And then, you know, there was some period of, of discussion, but then around the middle of summer of 2018, you know, tariffs started going up. So this is kind of, this kind of outlines a different place. This is like the trade weighted average tear that, that occurred. So one of the issues that I got to deal with is like, is, is how do you deal with this, especially the later periods? I'm only going to focus on the first period. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because when you look at the later period, you get into this instance of what we'll call like treated upon treatment upon the treated. So it's like, like, here's a way to think about this is like, so there's all this question is Omicron really as se less severe than other variants? Well, it's hard to tell because there's a lot of people out there with prior immunity. So you, it's the same issue here. It's like at, during that period and the later period, there are communities that already had been hit by the tariff. So to kind of make the analysis really clean, I'm just gonna take like focus on this really short window within a week, year basically, or like I got the back period back to Manuel's thing is, but up to you know mid 2019. Um, here's my consumption measure. This is the new auto sales. I bought it from IHA's Polk. I have it all the way till, I actually have it further than this thing. Now here's the key thing. This goes back to, so first thing, this is by locale of registration. So I see Jonathan just walked out of here, but when Jonathan buys, you know, BMW, you know, 
it's going to be registered in State College, not in New York City. So even if you bought it in New York City. Okay, so the thing is, is that it's always by where it's registered, first registered kind of thing. So it's getting directly at the place like where that person lives kind of thing. Um, back to uh, Cecilia's kind of point, I do see make model. I can, I can, I can do stuff by luxury, not luxury truck, truck. Like I haven't done it yet. People keep telling me to do it. At some point, I will. Um, th these guys are kind of like sketchy about where the data came from. You know, it's derived from state DMVs. I'll show you how it matches up with NEPA. In fact, NEPA buys this data from them. And NEPA is using it when it comes up with advanced estimates of GDP. So this is like high quality kind of stuff. Um, let me see what time it is. I, like I could talk about this forever, but you know, I think it has, I mean, it's cars, but it, this is, as, I think, as good as you can get, honestly, kind of thing. This is how it compares to NEPA. So like I just, like this is again in counts kind of thing. You know, NEPA is a little bit more volatile. There are some like month to month variation. I think it's about, I think there's a seasonal thing like about when is exactly, is it registered in January or December kind of thing. But for the most part, the stuff like tracks each other like very high, both in levels and in growth rates kind of thing. Um, so this is again, like I think a very kind of compelling kind of measure. And you see the COVID thing too, right there. Like, a, you know, that's like <laughs> it's like, it's like striking kind of thing. Hey Mike, and then you, you, yeah. these are all um, consumer purchases or you just see, you can't tell whether a consumer or a business purchase. I can't. So that's what the thing is. So I, when IHS hands me the data, I take out things like bus. I see like buses. I see, you know, large trucks, um, stuff that like, I don't know if you drive a bus, maybe you do, but I'm assuming that most households don't drive buses. So I throw buses out. I think one of the reasons why I don't match up and like there is a small difference in like levels, it's because I actually caught this recently is that I was handling Volvos. I drive, I drive two Volvos. I was handling Volvos wrong because there's, Vo I assume Volvos were just all households drive Volvos like I do, but Volvos actually make a lot of trucks and they're driving semis. And so I need to take out the Volvo semis kind of thing. That's the issue here. And I think that's NEPA, NEPA is only like this series right here is only stuff um, light autos, which again, could be going to households or businesses kind of thing, but it's not the, the big semi stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the big thing is, is for like rental car companies or. Yeah, so rental car companies is interesting because what they do is they have strategic places where they like to register them. So for example, one of the places that has the largest number of registrations you'll see is like Tulsa. So what they're doing is they're, and so they're, they're like when you ask the provider, they're known places where they register these things. Phoenix is another big one. So I leave it in there, they, I've taken them out. It doesn't matter kind of thing when I do this stuff. So um, Next. here's like the, like some summary statistics. Like I gotta get moving, I'm sorry. But like, if you guys ask, just like to pause me if I'm talking too fast um, about this stuff. I sorted this on the Chinese tariff. This is different than that time series figure because it's like at the county level. So this is back, this isn't a trade weighted tariff. This is at the county level employment weighted tariff. And so it goes down a lot because remember most counties aren't, most people don't work in traded activities, right? So the, so like you see the upper quartile, the tariff exposure is like almost four, lower quartiles, virtually zero kind of thing. Um, and this is also back to the Emmanuel's point, this is the, the change in the tariff, not the level, right? That's how much it changed off the MFN, initial MFN kind of thing. I have the US tariff here as well. You know, it's kind of correlated with it. So the same places that got hit with the, with the China tariff also were places that the US tried to protect. And we can come back to that. There's two things I want to point out about this slide, though, that are so first autos per person or per population are actually quite similar across these places. So there's no like differential in like car intensity kind of thing, which is good. The one difference between these places is the places that were more exposed to the Chinese tariff are also far more oriented towards goods production. So, it, I mean, it's kind of natural, but it's like, again, it's kind of think about like places in Iowa, you know, 
they're producing a lot of goods. They just happen to also be heavily more exposed to, to tariffs um, kind of thing. I also have the, the Trumps are handing out money to the guys, especially farmers. I FOIA'd it. I have the data. I actually have individual level data on these payments. And then I aggregate it up according to the county level kind of thing. It's actually quite small. It's like a hundred bucks per person in these counties kind of thing. Um, so, so it kind of doesn't matter. People were complaining about this in the past. Um, okay, here's like the first kind of like the simplest thing you can do, literally. Like this is like card Kruger kind of thing. It's just like two by two difference in difference kind of thing. So what I'm going to do is take the, the 12 month difference in logs of auto sales growth and then just compare the upper and the bottom quartile pre and post. Okay, so if you look at the first column is pre-trade war, the guys in the upper quartile are growing up about, the way to interpret that's like 1%. Auto sales are growing up 1% per at an annual rate. Bottom quartile, about 1%. So that's like good, right? Like these both, like this kind of satisfies like the pre-trend kind of thing. We'll look at this in a second, but so both growing at a similar rate, Post-trade war, what do you see? Now a difference opens up. So the upper quartile is declining by three percentage points. So the growth rate goes from one, or that's four percentage points, right? So from one down to minus three. Whereas the bottom quartile, it's falling as well. So these guys are eating, like buying less cars as well, but only by, you know, what's that? One and a half or two and a half percentage points. Now. So automatically, just by looking at this, that difference right there is telling us that something seems to happen in the places that were more exposed to the Chinese tariff relative to those places that were less exposed kind of thing. Now you can do, like, I'm not gonna hide behind stuff. I'll go show you like visually what this looks like. So I'm gonna take the difference across these things and just look at the time series thing. And you definitely see noise in this stuff because this is like moving up and down. But what you see is everything's, the difference between these high and low counties is about zero on average up until right around that tariff starts to take hit in in July of 2018. And then it looks like the high tariff place is growing relatively slower relative to the low tariff uh, locations kind of thing. And then it persists for about a year and then it kind of comes back up kind of thing which is natural with it. Like if you think about this is all in differences, but in levels of what this looks would look like is a permanent kind of decline. And then it just kind of levels off kind of stuff. Okay, any questions? Sam's like looking at this really good. Yeah, why, why is, I couldn't quite see why you aren't just doing this in levels. I, can you just give a quick explanation of what's the of thinking in Seasonality. Change? Seasonality is the big issue is the log differences sweeps out any kind of, and also takes out any like, any, like visually like this also deals with fixed effects. Think about there's a county effect and then there's a seasonal effect. So you and could just put in uh, month dummies or something. Yeah. Probably would that. get something similar, do you think? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Okay. I find it, I don't, I know. I like, it, it, so we, I have this colleague, uh, Andrew Goodman Bacon, who's like, like all-star and diff and diff thing. And he said this thing, which was actually interesting. He's like, what do you say is it goes uh, the, the level that your intuition about understanding stuff decreases uh, at the rate of like how many times it's difference squared, <laughs> <laughs> squared. <laughs> so this is like, I, I get it, but that's the, that's okay. the simple reason why I'm doing this. You can do a, and then I'm gonna just run some regressions and then kind of like show you some more formal stuff, which basically cleans this stuff up really well. And, and you get really robust results from this. So, you know, again, this is a bunch of sorry. equations. Yeah, Fernando. Yeah, sorry, maybe you already mentioned this. Uh, you talked about the subsidies that Trump was giving uh, to kind of supposedly offset some of these things. Yeah, this this slide right. Ah, here. that's the MFP. I see. MFP. Yeah. So I actually, dude, if you know any of these guys, you could we go back here. I love this. Is I got the, I know everyone who got this money. Is anyone here work with M and M Farms? <laughs> Sam, you had, like the Sam has like chickens in his backyard. He might be there too. So the deal is, is like a lot of these payments went to, they went to big corporate farms that are spread out all over the place, kind of thing. 
Like that's very hard. And then what you see is stuff like what it looks like is scammers. Like James Tatum here. I don't know. I know this is online, but like J James Tatum got 2000 bucks and he lives in Florida. I mean, we can Google, like we can figure out his address, like 7641 Clementine Way kind of thing and figure out what's up with him. But I think it's it's not a big deal. That's the bottom line, these payments kind of thing. Um, I don't know, you trust me, but maybe you don't. You're not big in size or, because I'm just wondering, maybe, you know, the heterogeneity there can also give you some. I mean, the size was something, the first payout was about $10 million, but okay. it's like geographically spread all over the place. And it doesn't seem it correlated. We'll see this in a second. It's not correlated with, at all with like your your kind of tariff exposure kind of thing. So okay. yeah, thanks. So this is like a one specification. You know, I'm kind of kind of trying to control for pretrends with these like like interacting time with fixed county characteristics. That's that second term. I have time effects in there. The big issue right now in terms of time effects too is that the Fed started tightening exactly around this time period. And so real interest rates are going up and that's obviously gonna affect, um, or nominal interest rates are starting to go up and that's obviously gonna affect uh, auto purchases. So controlling for the, the time effect is important as well. And again, sorry, Sam, I do it in first differences rather than the, the, the level. I, <laughs> So this is what you see, like, so the first one is like no controls at all. And like, this is just like the simplest thing here. And you basically get an elasticity of one. So basically, you know, a change, you know, that the, the one percentage point change in the tariff leads to literally a one percentage point change in, in auto sales, in the growth rate of the auto sales in that county kind of thing. Number, column number two is if I just focus on the US tariff, so we thought like Trump told us this was going to make these guys' lives better off. If you look at this, it's like it actually hurts them, right? It's like and it, like their their auto sales go down as well. My preferred specification is number five. Is like I have time by observational controls, time effects, everything in there. What do you see on the Chinese side? Always this elasticity about minus one. It's impossible to knock that thing out. Like it's just it's there. Like it's just, the, I mean, that's the bottom line. The US tariff becomes insignificant. So it looks like it does nothing. And then those MFP things that those payments, I put that in there, that does nothing. Zero, precise zero kind of thing right there. Um, so Mike, one, one question yeah. uh, on, on this specification. So this is the 12 month uh, difference. Yeah. So it's as, so the interpretation here, is it like, you know, the tariff changed in a specific month and then in that specific month through employment or some other thing, we have this effect on auto sales. Is that the yeah. case? Yeah, well, let's see. Well, I'll do a dynamic kind of thing in a second. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can see here's employment. Mike, yeah, just, just picking up on that question, the identification here is across county. So if you put in the, uh, that's why you like having controls of uh, the county yeah. characteristics, yeah. right? Yeah. If you put in county fixed effects, everything's gone because it's well, a long difference, uh, uh, a long difference identification. No, so I've already differenced it once. Oh, okay. okay. Now I have done this with, on the difference, you could put the fixed effect, county fixed effects in as well. That's kind of weird. Because <laughs> it's literally saying like counties have different growth rates kind of thing. And right, I'm going to control right. for that. But I did it. Like that's, it's, it's cheap to do. Right? <laughs> and the thing is, you still, like that number actually goes up. Yeah, no, so the, the question I guess was yeah. picking up in Emmanuel's question was whether it was the timing or the cross county. Yeah differences and it's a cross-county characteristics yeah. it seemed to be which is very plausible yeah yeah i mean what's happening uh, i just i can talk about this i'll just keep moving forward and i'll look at the dynamic stuff in a second employment goes down as well so this is total employment in that count total private sector employment in those counties um you get the similar kind of thing the only thing that's funny is it's like the u.s tariff looks like it's actually the u.s tariff side actually looks like it's hurting places that were more protected by trump we're actually suffering more. Um, that's kind of funny, but I didn't do, I don't know. Um, 
And then, but if you actually look at, so this is goods employment, it's mostly con obviously in the goods sector. So these are the Sorry, is, that are more trade exposed. Is that yeah. partly just because of what you said earlier where the, the Chinese tariffs at the county level are correlated with the US tariffs? And so in some sense, the US tariff being negative is because the Chinese tariffs were hurting the... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think I, I'm more concerned when I look at the dynamics that I have some pictures back mm -hmm. here is that when you look at just the US tariff side, is there weird pre-trends in the places mm -hmm. that were, so it, that's what I think is the issue. And then the US tariff side, I think is more subject to some issue. Like, I think a key, if you want a causal interpretation about this, mm -hmm is it you need some sense about the that tariff is uncorrelated with that error term, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think the US tariffs, so my understanding, the US tariff, I, I don't know how the US tariffs were selected, but you can invent some stories. My understanding about the Chinese tariffs is the Chinese tariffs were selected based off a EU list, which was designed to implement maximal punishment. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of, you know, that's kind of the thing that's going on here as well. Um, goods employment, you see the same kind of thing going on. Let me show you the dynamic stuff. You can run a kind of thing here. This is gonna pick up like forward looking stuff as well and kind of illustrate pre-trends as well, if there is an issue or not. So I'm gonna do the same kind of thing, differences, but I'm gonna project it on the future tariff rate. So the tariff that they're eventually gonna face in 2019. Okay, so every single period, I'm gonna like before and after, I'm gonna project it on the stuff out there in the future. And this is what you get. So this is auto sales. So this thing's hovering around zero. If anything, it's kind of going up a little bit during this time period, but almost like right around announcement, that's where my cursor is like moving up and down, auto sales in those places that are relatively more exposed starts to fall a lot and then kind of plummets, right? Like very quickly after kind of thing and then starts to go up kind of thing. So, you know, I, th this guy, I don't know like what people's tastes are about pre-trends or not, but I think this is, this okay, it's okay. Uh, and then this is again, it's like very clear kind of consistent estimate with an elasticity about minus one kind of stuff. Autos, employment's different. And then we'll come back to this, yeah. I, I kind of, I'll put another vote in for Sam's approach using levels, because you really like to know the cumulative effect. Um, you know, because in, in the end, it's all about, you know, you're going to adjust your uh, your durables proportionally to the change in wealth that you're getting from these shocks, right? Um, and so we we, we want to kind of, and you're, you're trying to back out the change in wealth, right? Um, and so the, the, the last picture you showed made it seem like it's a, a bigger effect than you were, you were, you were making it out to be with your other, other pictures. I don't know. I mean, I, I think the problem is, is when you have fixed effects and levels, the interpretation on that becomes, there's, there's an equivalent interpretation to what's going on here. That's the thing. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I, I can, I, I agree. I'd like to do it in level. I just, um, you know, this is a problem about writing a paper by yourself kind of thing. It's like, you can only do so many things at a time and um, I'll do it. <laughs> sure, sure. I agree. No, I like, I'm with you. I'm with you kind of thing. Um, employment is interesting because you start to see this run up in employment in the places that were most exposed. Um, so around like March, it looks like these places were doing relatively better than non-Chinese tariff places, like places that were relatively less exposed. Um, keep that in mind when we look at the model in a second, but this is, this is kind of an interesting thing. But then moment after the tariff is announced and then very soon after is employment starts to decline kind of substantially in these kind of areas. Um, so what, like, so let me kind of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It was just a quick question on whether you know anything about the sector, the, the relationship between employment and sector. I do. Break I mean, this I, down a little. Yeah, so like the problem about the data, employment data that I'm using, I use this like quarterly census of employment with like the BLS publishes. And the issue is, is that like some of these places is they have very concentrated employment in the firm. And so then the data starts getting masked. So I can't see the identify. So it's like you look in the cell, it won't show you how much employment is within a narrow sector in that county. 
because it's like it's basically reveal for example like imagine it's like purdue like chick we're talking about chickens again like when you look at parts in delaware like it's just purdue and so it's like, like the like it's gonna mass that kind of thing so that's why what i did to maximize coverage was either look at total employment or look at the goods producing which isn't ideal but at least like you don't run into any of these mass problems but the, the short answer is like if you do this by goods yeah for sure it's it's way more like this this number basically more pronounced yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um I'm thinking. Oh yeah, this is what I went through this, right? <laughs> okay, now I want to interpret this. So this, uh, like, this is the new stuff that I had this data stuff for a while, and then like our editor complained, so like I can't publish this paper without a model. So <laughs> I didn't know I couldn't do that. But um, so I developed the model, um, and then the way we're going to do this is think about this kind of you know heterogeneous agent, multi-region, multi-country trade model. And you know the goal eventually is to calibrate that kind of evidence I just showed you. Um, we're, we're not there yet, but like at least today I'm going to show you like how the, this model behaves, and and I actually think it behaves pretty good relative to what we saw. Um, and again, I mean, what's the role? Why am I messing with the model here? Is this issue that durable? Like, how do I interpret? It? Yeah, durables fell a bunch, but like, what's going on here? Um, connecting it with employment. And then the second issue George kind of took off, but it's about like levels is that, you know, the model basically, I have diff and diff evidence, but I don't know really anything about like the level, the treatment of this on the level kind of thing. And then, so the model's basically gonna fill in the place and allow me to speak about that. Hey Mike, uh, yeah. why do you need such a complicated model? Why not just chapter 2.5 of Oxfeld Rogoff? Like where they just have guys, you know, buying durables and non-durables. Like, why do you need like all the extra stuff? Why do I need the extra stuff? Yeah, I knew someone was going to ask this question, kind of thing. I thought about it a lot. Um, okay. I think I think with um, the short answer is without labor supply. I think it's. Um, I don't think I need it. I think labor supply with market incompleteness makes this more subtle um, precisely because what's happening with, like uh, we talked about this earlier, but when there's market incompleteness, there's an, like an additional incentive to supply labor in good times or bad times, basically to accumulate assets and then be able to smooth it over time. And I think that's the, it's about, it's actually labor supply is the core issue here. Labor supply is the core issue. And then, I mean, I don't know, I'll say like a stuff that maybe doesn't sound good, but I find this interesting and I can do it. You know, sure. with like Thomas is here, like we put this together. This is, this sounds beefy. We're gonna solve this on mic without parallel processing, like pretty straightforward stuff in seconds. The path will be about 10 minutes. Like this is like, like this is the, I'm excited about it. Okay, this is what it's gonna look like. So this is like discrete time, infinite horizon, guys live in. Um, the way we're gonna set up today is there's gonna be two regions in the US. I'm gonna call it red and I'm gonna call it blue. <laughs> and then there's gonna be China floating around there. Um, and then like each location is gonna basically produce a, a, like their own different differentiated commodity. So this is gonna be, I'm gonna do like a Armington kind of setup. Um, and then there's going to be trade costs, and then there's going to be tariffs floating around here. Um, now, households is where the like the the heart of the model operates. Is households are going to be living in a region, so they're going to be stuck there. They're not going to be moving around like I've done in other papers. And then when they're stuck, they're going to face like idiosyncratic productivity shocks. So then there's going to be some distribution given on their assets, you know, and that'll affect their 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 propensity to consume and save and so forth. Now, what are they doing? So they're gonna purchase this aggregated commodity coming from the trade side. And then given that aggregated commodity, they can do a bunch of stuff with it. They can eat it in terms of non-durables. So that's gonna be C. I'm gonna give them a technology where I can transform the non-durable into a durable. And that's gonna be a car, okay? Or what they can do is take that, that, that final commodity and convert it into an asset that can be carried across time. All right, so in sense the, the, so this is the choices that they have. And then households have a labor supply choice so they can enjoy leisure if they want by choosing not to work. 
So the way we're going to set this up is, is like this. So there's, you know, a mass of L households in each location, time separable preferences. Let me talk through utility here a little bit. So log is important, but there's a, like there's some, you know, curvature on the peer utility function over a composite of non-durables and durables. And we're just going to do Cobb Douglas today on that. So alpha one minus alpha. All right. Then there's a, they, enjoy, they can enjoy leisure if they want. So that's the new parameter times L, given how much leisure that they're enjoying at that time period. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in some gumball or type one extreme value shocks, which both basically facilitate like both computation and help interpretation of the data, which I'm not exploiting right now. So like EDJ is gonna be the, the, type, the logit shock or the extreme value shock on the choice of, do I buy a new car or not? Okay, so what this is gonna do is for purely idiosyncratic reasons, I'm gonna wake up and be like, I'm gonna buy a car, unrelated to my wealth, unrelated to my Z shock, like my idiosyncratic pressure, you just buy a car or not. Um, you might choose to buy a car or not. That doesn't, you always have the choice, but that's gonna be shown up there. Then the other a simplification I'm gonna make, which also makes it kind of a bit more realistic is that leisure, oh, I misspelled leisure here. Leisure work, this choice is gonna be discrete as well. Either I'm in the labor force or I'm not in the labor force. And again, I'm gonna set this up with, with, the, with the logic shock type thing. And again, that kind of facilitates the computation as well. Um, so this is how cars are gonna work. So this is a one car world. Everyone only has one car. Everyone always has a car, okay? But the choice is, do I get a new car or do I let my stock of cars depreciate over time? So that's how it's working right here is if I stay, my current durable stock, my car depreciates by some rate, one minus delta. So it's like, I'm driving my Volvo today and tomorrow my Volvo is a little less valuable kind of thing. And then I just let that go. If I buy a new car, I reset my durable stock. And it's gonna to go to some new level, D of it. D of N isn't a choice. D of N is just some level, like it's gonna be normalized kind of thing. So it's just like, oh, I get a new car. And so I get a new quantity units of that particular thing, All right? Now, when we map this into expenditures, I'm gonna do this in consumption units of the non-durable good. So if I'm not buying a new car, I'm not spending anything. So my expenditure on it is in consumption unit, non-durable consumption units is zero. If I do buy a new car, what I can do is I trade in my old car. So that's PU times D, where D is the, like the quality units of my old car. And then I can acquire the new car at PN, DN kind of thing. And then these prices, I have a P. I mean, the way I think about it is this is just purely a technology that transforms non-durable consumption units into durable consumption units kind of thing. All right, so that's, this is how cars are, working. is this clear what's going on here? Okay, everyone's shaking, Dorian's shaking her head, I see it, so. Households then, what are they gonna do? They have efficiency units evolve according to some finite state Markov chain, and then they face wage per efficiency unit W, I of T in their particular location. So then these households can borrow in this non-state contingent return. I'll come to the return in a second. Then they get some tariff revenue that's rebated to them, this tau of R. And then if you look at their budget constraint, it's basically, it's pretty simple, except that I have the price level floating around here because it's different in different countries. So this is the total amount of labor earnings that they get. So the wage per efficiency unit, their efficiency units times their work choice, whether they're enjoying leisure or not. This is in the local consumption units, the returns on those assets. This is that tariff revenue that they get. These are those assets that they accumulate, consumption and expenditure units kind of thing. Okay, so pretty straightforward, except for the P floating around. Um, then trade looks here pretty standard. So, you know, there's an Armington aggregator on each location. Production technology is linear. What's different here is remember households are different in efficiency units and their labor supply choice. So N isn't just bodies, it's actually efficiency units. So you gotta aggregate that up. And then trade faces iceberg trade costs and then tariffs. And then like I saw, I showed you the price index before, you know, there's gonna be some price index associated with this kind of thing. Okay, 
So how much do I, have? oh, I have this perfect for time. Okay, so equilibrium, I'm not gonna, like I actually, I now I really love definitions of, of equilibrium, but I'm not gonna bore you with this, but I do wanna highlight what's happening here is this is like, you know, everything needs to line up. That's the key issue. But the way to think about this is I can always solve the household problem given prices. So you have me prices, I can tell you what households are doing. And then I can aggregate up households and figure out goods demand, labor supply. And then what does the trade module of, the, of this model doing? It's connecting households across different countries so that good supply and labor demand have to line up with what they're doing kind of thing. And then basically what we need to do is find some prices so everything is in equilibrium, all right? So there is one detail that I'm gonna add is about the bond market, okay? So right now, like I, we just ran out of time. Like this is like, Thomas is like probably, you know, he's probably needs to go to bed for the past, like, you know, for the next weekend or something. I do, I do like that we've been like grinding this thing. Um, you know, the way to think about the bond market, right? It's not that clear. It's like, I have a technology, I can put coconuts in the ground and tomorrow some more coconuts come out. That's the way to think about it. That's not what I'm gonna do in the future. So you can do a couple different things. We can do financial autarky. Uh, so the bond market clears domestically. Financial integration, so the bond market clears internationally. Maybe something more fancier than this. I don't know. I mean, I'm interested in hearing thoughts about this as well. But this is kind of back to George's kind of thing. Is there's kind of a more compelling. I I like these settings because there's an interesting asset market trade going on here, and and that's something to explore more in the future. Um, yeah, Mike. I mean, if yeah. you want to get serious about it, though, I mean, like the cars are maybe coming from Japan and. You got a model like the current account flows that way as well. Um, I mean, you're obviously serious about it. Sorry, I said, but you know, no, like, I know. I'm, I'm. It's like how I'm trying to. I think the thing is, is I, the thing I really don't want is to think about. I don't want to have to have like a separate car sector. Yeah, but some sense in which, yeah, you know, Dorian told me this a long about. about my paper with Spencer is like, you know, how this interest rate moves around, I think is, I, I convinced myself too, is this important and then kind of handling that is. But it seems like just, the, first, yeah. the first sort of thing you were talking about is just a difference in difference results, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so that the GE macro stuff is gonna be kind of less important. I mean, interesting, but a little bit less important. Well, I don't know though, that's the thing. I, you know, that's, a year ago, I would have agreed with you. Now I ran this thing out, and I think it is important. Okay. I think it's it's. Uh, you'll see. Like, let's talk through what I'm gonna yeah, show. Yeah, sure. Kind of thing. Um. I yeah, I, I gone back and forth whether now I'm actually even more confused about difference and difference kind of stuff. Is like what's how do we actually interpret it? So let me kind of. So I'm going to set this up like this is admittedly crude. I just jiggle like literally five minutes. I was like, I think this is kind of looks reasonable. That's my calibration approach, right? It was just like, that's it. Um, the only thing I spent some time on kind of trying to do was how I set this up. So the want operator is goes back to that table is what it looks like is that there's this blue region. You can infer what I mean by this as well. <laughs> the blue region isn't really exposed to China. But the red region produces all these goods that are exported to China kind of thing. And so that's kind of, I want to set this up. Whereas like there's two regions in the US. One is just like just a New York City. They just like doing their own thing. And then there's Iowa. And they're like shipping the stuff out to China and they're really exposed to it kind of thing. So I set up the trade costs to kind of reflect that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate a change in tariffs. And then the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to give them news. So this is going to be a news shock. So I'm going to give them about three periods advance notice about an observed, like a tariff change that that's going to look like what we saw in the data. And then again, this idea that China is going to target the red region more intensely than the blue region. And then the, what the U.S. is doing on the other side is basically putting a uniform tariff on all kind of Chinese goods. So it's like the Ch U.S. isn't targeting really. They're just like, we're going to put the tariff up like blindly. Whereas China's like, we're gonna hit those red guys kind of stuff. And then the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do this like permanent change. Again, this is like, I'll do a shout out that Kim had this paper on like cows and stuff. 
And then like you could do something like that. But you know, what's funny is like, dude, we're in 2022, we still got these tariffs. So I don't know. Um, so this is what happens in the model. So this is like, these are new cars in the model. All right, so everything I'm gonna do is like percent deviation from the initial steady state. And so what do we have here? I have the back backfill part, like we're rolling around, everything's on a steady state. Then time zero, there's a Trump in the model and he starts like tweeting out, hey, I don't like you. And then, then this pat traces out how the cars behaves in these two regions kind of stuff. And so what you see is like, yeah, the place more exposed to China, cars start, like new car purchases start declining by, you know, substantial amounts, but also in the blue region too, like everyone's kind of like reducing their car purchases as well, but a gap is opening up there between these two places. And then if you actually take the difference, which is like starting to look like that diff and diff kind of panel, like that I showed you, what you see is two places, no difference. And then a difference starts opening up. And if it, like, I don't want to spend much time about these magnitudes because this is still like kind of work in progress, but I kind of just eyeball them. This is looking like actually exactly like kind of what you see in the in the data. Um, so again, like, I think this kind of goes back to George's thing is I see like a one percentage point difference between these two counties, but the level actually is substant. There's a big drop in new cars here kind of thing. So that's what I kind of said, George, back to you is like the level there's a big move in the level, even though the difference isn't, isn't that large kind of stuff. Um, here's labor supply, is you're gonna see the same thing. Labor supply, so first thing I would say, the labor intrinsic labor supply elasticity in this model is actually really low, because it's always in or out, and there's no like nothing funny going on with honey, home production, stuff like that. But what happens in this model though, is like when I give these guys news, about the tariff coming up, people want to start working today, right? They want to take advantage of the fact that today is good, tomorrow is going to be bad, and this is all about intertemporal labor supply. So it actually creates kind of a mini boom everywhere, but a, a bigger boom in the place that is going to get hurt the most, which is kind of interesting kind of stuff. Now, like uh, the timing's a bit off, but I just will remind you is that it did look like the place that got hurt the most was experienced in a boom in the, in the diff and diff kind of evidence, that kind of thing. Now, when you look at these two figures, you might look at them and say, well, they're, they're like on top of each other. But if you do the difference, you get the same kind of thing. So this is kind of mimicking that diff and diff evidence. You look at the magnitudes here, it's starting to kind of look very much like that diff and diff evidence that we saw earlier, which again goes back to the point is like the diff and diff evidence might look small, but the levels are moving around a lot kind of thing. And so that's why, back to you, George, I mean, that's why I, I think that, that point about GE response for is, I think it's central kind of thing. Um, Mike, so I missed it, but what's the what's the channel through which the blue region is also getting hit? Yeah, so this is like this is the G I, I that to, you're talking about. Okay, so there's two things. I think the way to think about the blue region is that the price levels going up, so goods are becoming more expensive. But what that means, why are these guys changing their labor supply? Is because that's lowering the real wage out there in the future. So they're gonna work less out there in the future, that's here. But that's not, a, that's not happening here. So they wanna take advantage of the high relative real wage today, relative to the low relative real wage in the future. But for the blue region, this is purely through a change in the price level. This is like the stuff like when, when you look at like Pablo's paper with, with Penny about price effects, this is like that channel is just working through prices of goods becoming more expensive. So one question here, you yeah. have both a uh, US putting tariffs on China and uh, China putting tariffs on the yeah. US. But so if you did just the China tariffs on the US, how much would you action would you see in the blue region? Yeah, I don't know. I, that's what, that, yeah, that's what I was heading toward. I need to do that kind of thing because the blue region, because the, or the, yeah, you'd suspect that the blue region wouldn't move that much. And then the red wheat region would move because it's purely like a labor demand shock. So the red region, labor demand's falling. 
the wage is going to adjust, and then these guys are going to supply labor in a, a different way. Does that answer? Like both Dorian and Anna, does that or Cecilia? Does that answer? Yeah. No. No. Uh, I actually have a follow up. I'm a little confused. So there's an Armington assumption. Each of the three yep. regions produce a different good. In the, um, isn't it key the complementarity or substitutability between these goods? Yeah, for sure. I and I and, like I said. And what I are just, you assuming? What? I think I, I put my favorite number of four for the. <laughs> for the so thing. It's, was, they're all substitutable. Yeah, they're all substitutable. But you could do. I, I mean, I totally agree. Like you could do something fancy, which I I think I'm going to do in the future is like think more about sectors here like to further disaggregate it more. Again, I don't have like the exact data, but you can do the least with the tariffs and think more about the sector and the, like the network structure. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the, but I don't want to keep you, but I, the, yeah, I don't know. I mean, how I, it plays I, out. So the prices and the Chinese goods goes up and blue and spoil, that would be an opportunity for the blue, but then they get the other effect. <laughs> yeah, so you actually yeah. see that the blue country okay. actually starts trading more, the blue region starts trading more, which, like China starts importing more stuff from the blue guys. So there was this like, like trade diversion kind of thing into blue regions. Right, but it's not enough to increase employment there. Okay. And then here's like, then I can do it into non durable consumption. It's the same kind of thing. But then you can get kind of, so the, the idea is like eventually to invert like what this is for welfare. And then you can kind of, here's like, I mean, I, again, like this is just kind of my numerical example, but this is the distribution of welfare in these models. So what I'm doing is like every single guy in there, like what do they, what do they gain or lose kind of stuff. I think the thing to, there's two things I want to point about this figure. So one thing is with the durable good, I don't know if you guys know this stuff, but like by Greg Kaplan and Violante, they have these like two asset kind of Billy Igar. One of the benefits of those models is you get more guys at the borrowing constraint. That's happening here because you have these, I don't know, you guys probably see them in parking lots is I'll call them uh, cash poor or car poor people. You know what car poor people are? They have a nice car, but they're poor, right? I hear this because people say you're home poor kind of stuff. That's what happens in these models is in this model here is you have a bunch of people with a new car, but they're up against the bar and constraint. So that's why you kind of see these guys. These guys are here. They just bought a car and then they got <laughs> bad timing, right? You're up against the bar and constraint. It hurts. The other thing I noticed is the levels like much different. So even these guys at the worst, they maybe lose maybe 1%, but in the red region, they're losing about, you know, 1.4% kind of thing. Um, so you do definitely do kind of get this action. But again, it goes back to Cecilia's and, and Dorian's point about which is doing what and why kind of thing. I don't have an answer with that as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up on time. This is pretty good. Um, this is what I've done. I'm not going to repeat this. What I'm working on now, we're going to try to, I'm going to try to calibrate this, prove treatment of the, the asset market. You know, I'm on a roll right now, like, a, you know, fortunately. So talk to me in a month. Hopefully nothing bad happens. Um, and then like I'll shout out for Thomas has been like hugely helpful. Like we, and right now we're kind of posting, piecing together like a GitHub repo to actually like show how to like how we did this, how we solve these like heterogeneous agent kind of trade models uh, fast and efficiently. So if you guys are interested or have students interested, look at that. And um, no Gauss, George, no Gauss. <laughs> the big barrier entry. I know, right? It's like hard working with like 1980s technology. Oh. Sam's paper with Jonathan, the econometric one was Gauss too. So then I don't, hopefully Sam moves forward, but you know, so. All right, well, a little bit of commentary there at the end too, good. Uh, okay, so uh, we will open up for, very good, Mike, we'll open up for questions <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and comments. And Mike, I would note there's also a question in the chat room. Oh. Um, I can just read it to you in case you don't see it. Just says, is the assumption that the tariff is going to stay, can we differentiate between the effects of short-lived tariffs versus perpetual tariffs? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the that's I, that's a good question. I, I think um, I don't know. I but I think it's important to thinking about these these responses to expectations kind of stuff. And 
And, uh, the only other thing I'll notice, uh, point out is like, so the Wall Street Journal actually did a bunch of articles like interviewing people, like in particular in Iowa about the, the, the Chinese tariffs. And, you know, they were very upset because it viewed as in the sense that they had built all this capital to supply the Chinese kind of market and it was completely destroyed. And even if the tariff went away, they viewed it as a permanent effect. That the Chinese went and started buying stuff from Brazil and then their market was eroded kind of thing. And so I, you know, I think this is, but I think, it, I mean, I, I don't know, I'll plug it like Kim and George and there, and, the, and then there's all the students at Rochester is like thinking about these, these are, this is an actually really nice setting to think about like news shocks and expectations because of the way it ran out. You can complain about Trump, but his tweeting behavior around this episode was amazing. And the fact that it went through with it, like the thing is, is like it so it gives like you, you have a really well defined like, hey, guys, this is what I'm doing. I mean, there's a question about if he's credible or not. But like, I mean, I think this is this is I don't know, I like this episode. So. All right, so like, good. I, I, I Go think ahead. that's it. That's a good point about like the permanent effects of the tariff, even if the tariff goes away. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, you know, the U.S. did put like a the U.S. Um, limited soybean exports in the '70s, and and that's basically when um, Argentina and Brazil kind of really uh, took flight with with soybeans. So that was kind of like a permanent shock, even though the you know that, that policy went away. So um, you know, distinguishing to to, to what extent like it's the tariff versus people's now change in expectations about, you know, just U.S. commitment to free trade is, is something you can also kind of pick up here. Um, and there's precedent for it. Um, as you work on this, I was wondering if the tariff is the stick, is there a carrot in terms of a most favored nation trade status that, that enters this or some uh, parallel studies you're doing? Well, okay, so I'm going to talk about stuff that was pretty painful for me. Is like leading into January 2020, I was like, dude, I got this lined up because I got the data. I got like, I've been thinking about this. Trump signs this deal with China, phase one. And I was like, okay, now, not only do I get to see the terror, but I get to see this deal and how it helps places. And then <laughs> COVID blew this whole thing apart. Like, there's no way, like, I, I mean, because that's ideally what the carrot is you'd want to use phase one to kind of like figure out if it helped people or not. But I mean, it, you look at the COVID stuff, it's just like, it's like I'm trying to like, you know, like piece something very finely together and the nuclear explosion, blow, like explosion happens around it and you can't, like, there's no way to piece it together given COVID. And it's a shame. I mean, it's a shame for a lot of reasons, but I mean, that's like for the, this research agenda, it, it blew a hole in it, it blew a hole in it. So, and then and my phase one's like, I mean, China hasn't lived up to it. You know, it's just some numbers on some paper and it's not even clear how the Biden administration is going to deal with this. I don't know, maybe COVID clears up and we see something else in the future. But I, you know, I got to say this because this is live stream. I forgot to say it. Anything I say does not represent the Federal Reserve System or the Minneapolis, so, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> these are just my personal views. Mike? Yeah, Ben. Tell me. Um, I mean, another asset that, you know, as a former Iowa resident, what happened to land prices of soybean producing areas? That would get a sense of what the expectations of whether this was permanent. People thought of this as permanent or transitory. I think anecdotally, I think farm values were declining during that time. And then bank farm bankruptcies were going up because these guys were levered too, leading into that time period. But I don't, I mean, I haven't looked at it systematically, but that would be definitely a way to do it. So I mean, it's a kind of, I think it's a cheap date. I think that there's county, does an ERS have county level land pricing? Could be. I don't know. I haven't, uh, but... it's a thought. Mike, uh, in your view, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that some editors said that you would need a motto here. 
and there was some disc there was some discussion about you know the, the merits uh, of the model here but you know now that we have seen everything uh, I mean not everything because you're going to do other things in particular you're going to do the welfare analysis but you know what do you think I mean what's your opinion on the you know the value added of the model uh, on our you know interpretation of the consequences of the trade war for consumption in the US? I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you Ellen McGratton's story about this. So Ellen, I told Ellen the story about exactly what happened. And then Ellen said, of course, that's what they'd say to you, Mike, because you're the guy saying to everyone else that they need a model to interpret. Stuff. And so I, I guess I just, this just comes back at me because um, I don't know. I mean, I actually, I mean, I, I think the strength of what I, I mean, I get people want the model and stuff. I do think this, the data is super strong. I think this is as clear and as compelling as it gets, but the model is intrinsically interesting and that's why I'm kind of interested in piecing it together. But um, I, it's always this problem, like the, I think there's this like fad out there. And I mean, I'm interested in it too, is like, how do you piece together credibly identified stuff with models? And, but it, it's kind of, there's always some, there's always some disconnect there that it's not, in some ways it's not quite, satisfying because it's like basically what I'm doing is like I'm filling in the level with the model and then there's a question about how credible that is and I don't know you just got to kind of believe me or or just say it's interesting and this is what happened so but uh Mike wouldn't yeah wouldn't I mean I guess I was a little um surprised by the magnitude of the level effect versus the differential effect so that that made me feel like the model had earned its keep just for that very reason. Yeah, no, I think I, no, I agree with, I think that's changed my mind in the past couple of days about looking at this is that is that the, the levels moving around a lot, even though the difference is, isn't that much. And I think it's, but, it, but I guess Sam, I mean, I don't know, you tell me is that, but the question is like, do you believe that level jump? or that like in the labor supply. And I don't know, I mean, I, this is come meta analysis kind of thing, but, but at yeah, least- I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not sure if I believe it or not, but I think it's kind of interesting <laughs> and I don't, yeah. it, it seems like you're trying to get at the truth. I don't know. I mean, I obviously I can't understand all the details in a short amount of time, but I did think it's kind of striking that that kind of an effect comes through. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, I, I, yeah, it's interesting. So I think that's why I'm working on it. Yeah. I mean, Mike, I mean, I think there is some evidence. I mean, I'll, I'll push some work I did with Carter Mix. There is some evidence that like, um, there's like macroeconomic effects to future trade reforms, um, kind of consistent with what, what you're finding here. Um, we did it looking at like GATT reforms and um, you definitely see like, if you, if you see a future liberalization it's kind of recessionary and then later on expansionary. It's hard to kind of map up the numbers that, that you have here, but those expansion, those, those effects are going to be in, in a representative agent model too, right? They're, um, and so I guess, you know, that, that's the question is what, what do you get by having like the heterogeneous agent um, versus the representative agent with a durable decision or any investment decision? Is it, is there something about like the identification of the shock or, 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 or something or the magnitudes that, the model is helping you pin down in some way. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, this is the, I, I agree. I need a better answer to this. Okay. But I think that, I mean, I, the only thing about the level stuff is, I mean, it, you can you can look at Fred on this, is like you look at manufacturing employment, Manufa manufacturing employment, immediately after this looked like it was head we were almost in a recession in terms of the manufacturing sector in the us so manufacturing slowed up there was a huge boom leading up into this point and then it started slowing dramatically and i don't know like covid again kind of erased our memories but i don't know if you guys remember it's like 2000 into 2019 stuff was slowing a lot in the us and you know it didn't look stuff didn't look super promising at that point in time and I think the manufacturing employment does look like, you know, as this played out, stuff where jobs were being lost in response to this. So.
All right, George, you want to kill the recording? I remember how to do that. <laughs> Especially now that Mike put his disclaimer out there. <laughs> we'll trim that off afterwards in post. Yeah. I guess, Mike, it's interesting. So when you mentioned that about the manufacturing going down, you're sort of there presenting the non-diff and diff empirical yeah. evidence that maybe you could diff that against another country or something and that was yeah, maybe like exposed to China's retaliation. And then that would make that sort of the level for the US, more like the level for the US, even though it would be the differential 